Is everybody in a food coma? Yeah. yeah? Good. That's good. You want to help us go ahead and wake people up and get people in here from the food? Just for, uh, I'm going to count to three, and I just want you all to clap and laugh as loud as you can. And people come in, they're like, what did I miss? You're like, you had to be there, OK? <laughs> One, two, three. Woo! Woo! Yeah! yeah. Ah. Nice, nice, nice. I love it. I feel good. You feel good? I feel great. I all feel right, great. you feel good? Yeah. All right, let's get into some React Native. All right, so React Native. We will be your guides. I am Gant Laborde, and with me always is Jamin Holmgren, the face of wonderful React Native Radio. Yes, I'm the face because it's radio. So, <laughs> uh, so I mean that we'll be your guides here because uh, I, there's a varying level of expertise that happened. So uh, as we kind of dig into this, let's go ahead and see what we're looking at. So why are we the ones up here? Because we actually run a company that's gone through quite a lot in React Native. We started in 2015. We've acquired all kinds of different resources. But it's actually just been a fantastic journey. And we want to tell you about what's coming up. So we've also done a lot of large products. Uh, there are some of these are some fun projects that you might have heard of, you might have heard of some of these companies. Uh, and you can come talk to us afterward. We'll be happy to talk about each of those technologies. Yeah, we have a lot of stories, um, some of which we can tell. So, <laughs> Right, exactly. <laughs> and additionally, uh, like I said, we're talking about React Native, the classic uh, concept of learn once, write anywhere. It's been around for a while. You've got your classic React APIs that you're familiar with. By now, it's battle tested. And then, of course, if you need to, you get access to the native layers. You get access down into native host platforms. You might hear me say host a lot. I'll say host, and I'll say native interchangeably, OK? Mm -hmm. So I need to know a little bit about the audience real quick. How many of you, raise your hand if you're familiar with React Native? Yeah. Oh, nice. even got wow. some claps. Good. Ooh, what's up, Expo team? OK. Uh, how many of you do native development, have done native development? All right, different subset there. And then now, with all the cool new terms that are coming through with React Native, how many of you are familiar with Fabric, Turbo Modules, Hermes, which is, you know. All right, there's quite wow. fewer hands. Yeah, we got some work to do. I think. Yeah. 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 So it'll be our goal to make sure that you can sound intelligent in these meetings instead of calling the future of React Native React Native Synergy or something like that. Okay? <laughs> so let's do a review. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people don't really get this kind of concept about how React Native uh, works and how it's into being. So the, the idea here is React Native Origins. We're going to kind of bring it back to the concepts uh, fundamentally. We'll zoom through that real quick. If you know this, it'll be easy. So yep, in a, with a React, you're familiar with the fact that it looks a lot like HTML. It looks a lot like you know, Compose, but we're cheating. It's JSX, right? So it's actually JavaScript, which is why you can't use class. You have to use class name. Exactly. Now. This kind of concept is, uh, is, is, is still an abstract component. And to be fair, it's dependent upon the DOM name of those components. But what would be really cool is if we just had abstracted that to be independent of the web platform. Wouldn't it be nice, instead of saying div, which doesn't make as much sense to me, if you were saying view, if you want something to scroll, it's a scroll view. And if you wanted something to just be text and say, saying paragraph tags and things like that, you would call those text. Those are sort of more abstract and platform agnostic. So you might be thinking, yeah, I have the virtual DOM inside of uh, React. But you know, we have something similar over in React Native. It's a little bit different because there's not actually a DOM, and you actually have to figure out how to lay things out. It's a similar set of concepts. Yeah, it's bringing web concepts over to mobile. And so you have, obviously, uh, something like CSS Flexbox. And they bring those concepts over there with Yoga Layout. Etc. You don't need to know that for this talk, but it's just good to know. Yeah, absolutely. So, so, so let's just take like a hypothetical here. Like if I was going to say there's text, then in React Native, if it was on a uh, if it was on iOS, it would be a UI label, and then if it was on Android, it'd be a text view. It actually goes down into what that would be for those particular platforms. And how does it do this? The classic way that usually handles this, as we've all heard, raise your hand if you've heard of the React Native bridge. Yeah. So you've got your React Native, you've kind of got this bridge, and you talk to the host platform in Native. So that's because, the concepts there. Because on uh, the JavaScript side, or the React side, you have JavaScript, and it's running in your, your app. But over on the Native side, 
you have native code and that's been compiled and they need to talk to each other. And so the solution up to this point has been a bridge and we're gonna be talking more about that. Yes, absolutely. So, so as a bunch of React, mostly React developers, there's a lot of React native hands that went up that made me very happy. But maybe you'll agree with me on this, is essentially you bring a lot of your React knowledge if you're going into React Native. You still have React-powered code, you still have your JavaScript expertise, things like NPM, you're bringing in all these cool libraries, some not so cool libraries, they can come too, <laughs> okay? But then you actually, the other percent of it, it's like 25% is actually understanding the platform specifics and then understanding those React Native abstractions and components that are on top of it. So if you're very familiar with React, it's very approachable and a lot of our clients come in with React projects that they want to go ahead and build a React Native project with that, that's coming in there. So we train a lot of React developers how to do React Native and they don't know how far along they already are. A lot of React developers will start using React Native and say, this is more familiar than I expected it to be. Yeah. Um, but it is a very different beast. And so we, uh, you have to, at some point, start knowing a little bit more about the platform. Exactly. And then, so what does this sort of like abstraction give us? It gives us sort of this cross-platform, xplat. We get uh, all kinds of cool devices that you can start to focus on by, by just letting go of these DOM-specific sort of elements. So like we said, how does it do it? It does it over the bridge. And this is where you hear, I, it's very difficult for me to ever cause this problem, but you hear people talk about the problem with the bridge because it's single threaded. So what's happening actually is the JavaScript is serializing the JSON and in trying to generally batch those and send it down to the host platform to run the code and then that creates JSON that gets serialized and sent back. So we're sending strings from JavaScript down to native when we need to, to have it do the native things, and then that sends strings back to us. And this is all done in a single threaded system that generally runs blazingly fast, but it has its limitations. And imagine if every time you wanted to call a function in JavaScript, you had to create a string, serialize it, send it somewhere, have that interpret it, and then run the function. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be slow, and that's kind of a problem. Exactly. So the bridge has limits. You can saturate the bridge. You can actually fill it up with all kinds of things. And there's no sense of priority as well. Uh, so there's all these concepts of priority that you're losing because you have to uh, read the whole thing at the same time because it's serialized. So there's been all kinds of awesome improvements to help speed up React Native. You probably already, or may have already heard of Hermes. It was announced at uh, Chain React in 2019. And Hermes is a JavaScript engine that's going to uh, optimize for React and React Native. And I hear that it's also used server-side in a few places as well. Yeah, Hermes is tuned specifically for the, uh, for the needs of a mobile app. Because mobile apps are different than websites. And they're different than a server-side side of things. So Hermes is optimized for, obviously, the faster startup. That's really important. You don't want it just sitting there on your loading screen on your app and waiting for it to load up. You want it to be as quick as possible and start really uh, working fast. The other really interesting thing about Hermes is you're not shipping JavaScript with your app. You're actually shipping bytecode. It actually compiles it to bytecode. That's a very interesting uh, uh, architectural decision. Yeah, time to first byte on devices. Very good. <laughs> so then you've heard terms like now there's talk about, we're going to talk a little bit more about things like Fabric. Now, Hermes has been out for a while, but these are the things kind of coming down the line. So here is like probably the most important slide that we have for you. <laughs> and you've already heard Shruti talk this morning. You've heard a lot of people talk about async. And this is sort of the lay of the land. If you've heard about uh, React, you've heard about synchronous React. And if you've heard about React Native going over that bridge, which so many have already raised your hand you heard about, you've heard about asynchronous React Native calls. Well, here's what's coming. Ta-da! <laughs> it took way too long to do that animation. I wish I could do it several times. OK. <laughs> but now, if you need to, you could tie into synchronous and interruptible React Native. And then, as you've heard from so many talks today about this concept of almost asynchronous React. So uh, who here knows what ver So React Native has React built into it, like embedded in it. Who here knows what version? Oh. Nobody? Come on, expert guys, you know. 17? Yeah. 17 is it. 
Uh, you, you might have said something else, but I'll just pretend like you said something. <laughs> <laughs> He's not mic'd. We can make him say whatever he wants. <laughs> Great job. Uh, 17. So obviously, all morning, uh, actually last night, today, you've been hearing about React 18 and all these great features that are coming. Yeah. But React Native is not shipping yet with React 18. So why is that? Why can't you just bump the version and move on? It's a pretty big change. And one of the problems with React Native being an asynchronous bridge, serializing up JSON, sending it across the bridge, waiting for it to come back several ticks later, eventually, you know, that's, that's a problem because there are a lot of features within concurrent React that need that kind of synchronous uh, back and forth. So this sets the stage for React 18 to come to React Native. And that's actually really important because uh, at, moving forward, everything React is going to be thinking about you know, these new concurrent features. We don't want to leave React Native behind. Exactly. That's the biggest thing to take away. Now, we can get a little bit deeper into it. Uh, take a look at what's coming through with re-rendering, with rendering engines. We have the integration with suspense, concurrency, as you've heard a lot about. Uh, easy, easier server-side rendering, um, that's going to be interesting. Improved interoperability, priority, and synchronous events is the big one for me. Yeah. So this stuff, it sounds like a lot of buzzwords, and there's a lot of stuff coming. But you're going to see some of the stuff land in certain ways. So this brings in um, the concepts of type safety with JavaScript to native platforms. Jamie's is going to talk a little bit about yeah. that as well. And then here's uh, JSI direct access. So this is no longer serializing uh, what's going on there. We'll kind of talk about that as well. Here's an interesting thing. Didn't expect to say this in 2022. But uh, yeah, shared C++ core. C++ is back. <laughs> what's up, retro? <laughs> Go find your books. Uh, no. You, don't, you generally won't have to worry about it. What this does is this creates a fantastic idea of um, in, in optimizing at the C++ level, you're getting the platform independence optimization. So an optimization that might happen for, let's say, Java, and you're, you're do it in C++, well, then iOS is getting it as well. Uh, and normally, traditionally, you would be doing that per host platform. And well, then, we of course, faster startup, time to first bite. What we've found in our consultancy is that most of our clients, we're not having to touch the native code much. It's usually JavaScript most of the way, all the, uh, all, most of the way through. But there are some situations, especially with libraries, and I maintain a few libraries that use native code. And what you're having to do is, yeah, you have JavaScript on I iOS and Android, but then on the native layer, now you have Swift or Objective-C, uh, and you have Java or Kotlin. Uh, you have basically two different host platform or native platform languages that are being written for the two. So now you have to, you have to maintain both. And in the case of uh, React Native WebView, we actually have three, because we're also supporting React Native Windows. Uh, that's, a, that's a project that I work on. So with, uh, with the C++, it is cross-platform. You can run it on all of those platforms. And it allows you to have a native layer and, a, and a, the, the JavaScript layer and have them both be just one code base each. Excellent. So yeah, the, the fantastic part about here is getting rid of the bridge. So with J, JSI, JavaScript interface, you're able to reach in directly and actually grab the variables um, without serialization. This is a huge speed boost. Um, this, this causes uh, interruptibility. We, we, could, we could bring in all those features. So you'll hear about JSI, and you'll hear about C++. But just to wrap that together, this is what's powering and replacing uh, the bridge. JSI enables some really interesting things because in the past, even if you had a, a method that you could call in native and get an immediate response just right back to you, like let's say for example, you wanted to get the current um, um, gravity. I think that's one of the things that you can pull out of like the accelerometer. Um, you, can, uh, you can do that synchronously in native, but uh, because of the bridge, no matter what you did, on the JavaScript side, it always had to be asynchronous. And that can be problematic in cases where you maybe want to do something really fluid, you know, like you want an animation or you want, you want a chart that's really, really fluid. Uh, it'd be nice to be able to just call that method and get the information back, get the number back. And this the JSI allows you to do that. You can register a method that then comes over to uh, the JavaScript side. It's totally synchronous. You don't have to wait for it to come, come back. This is kind of backwards from the whole asynchronous conversation we're having with React, <laughs> but uh, it allows some really cool things. Yeah. <clears throat> so if you were to take a look at that now, instead of having the normal bridge set up, we have the fabric uh, steps in between between React Native and the mounting to the, to the host platform. 
And these independent, these fabric steps are, uh, are actually immutable and thread safe. So we actually, we get, um, we get some optimization. Obviously that had to come in for supporting React 18. But what's really great about this is those React uh, platform ideas are gonna come in uh, and really, if you're building most React Native apps, you'll just kind of notice uh, that it's better. <laughs> Whoops, did I go twice? Maybe. Well, we skipped the unlucky slides. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And then here's another concept you might have heard. You might have heard turbo modules. So this is the last piece of what we wanted to make sure you actually, when you're in an intelligent conversation about React Native and you hear things like JSI, Fabric, Hermes, turbo modules that you can actually, well, yeah, we have a few more terms. We actually do, yeah. Lots of buzzwords. <laughs> <laughs> so what are turbo modules? Start off with what is a native module? So let's say you have an app and then you want to dig into the native platform uh, host code. And then so you wanted to ship something to, to go in there. So you had to write a native module to talk in. Well, native modules had a lot of problems, right? Eager initialization, the life cycle was a singleton so that if you had multiple instances in there, it would live and die and cause all these, uh, with the eager initialization, it would cause more startup time. You had no idea if something was even getting called. Uh, if you had multiple of the same thing, it wouldn't figure that out until runtime. All these things slowed down an actual app. Runtime, and, and the, all the native constants were also at, uh, run, at runtime. So this really slowed things down with the original native modules, and these are things that need to be fixed. Yeah, let's say that you had a feature that needed some sort of native access, and, but it was very rarely used. Like once in a great while, someone would need to go and do something in your app, and when that happened, they had to hit the native side. No matter what you did, every time that they would open up that app, it would load that module. It would load that whole, whole bit into memory. It would be sitting in the memory, waiting for something that never happens, slows down the initial load screen. This was problematic. So na the original native modules were pretty cool, but you kind of got to a point where if you had a lot of them, it became very problematic. And then we bring in turbo modules. So turbo modules is trying to fix this. Lazy loading native modules, um, untethered from the UI thread. It's got code gen. We'll get back to sort of explain that, but that's the, a little bit of the type safety that's planning to come through, as well as there's the goal, the promised goal of backwards compatibility for uh, regularly writing normal native modules. Right. So that brings the question, I said code gen a couple of times now, so uh, I don't know what it is. Jamin, what is code gen? Um, I don't know either. No, do you? No, no. I don't know. Uh, so the way that it worked with the original modules, so modules, think of them differently as the, from, from components. Components are, of course, UI layer. Modules are more like, more, more like services, just things that you need to get information in and out of or, or whatever. Uh, the problem before was in order to, to, to call in your JavaScript, to call a native you know, module and have it do something, you had to register that at the beginning. I mentioned that in the previous slide. And so the native side was telling the JavaScript what's available. With CodeGen, it flips the other way around. So your JavaScript, and specifically your TypeScript, or in some cases, Flow, uh, because Facebook still supports that, uh, <laughs> The, the types that you're writing there inform the native side what's happening. And there's some boilerplate code that connects that up with the C++ side of things. And CodeGen allows you to not have to worry about that. It will just work. And that allows you then to have lazy initialization, but to have your TypeScript types still be correct and your, and your native types still be correct. Because whenever you're connecting two systems like this, you need to make sure that the types and the shapes are actually matching mm -hmm. and you're not just kind of blindly firing and hoping it hits. Yeah. So we've hit you with a lot of terms uh, that you probably might have heard in the React Native world as well. So when are these terms kind of coming into existence? When are these, the, these promises of, of what we have here going to happen? Well, you've got some of these features in React Native 67. Uh, for a while now, you've been able to enable Hermes, Hermes. Uh, for React mm -hmm. Native. Turbo and then, modules. And turbo modules. So React Native 68, there is a flag that you can turn on to sort of start trying to use some of these features. Fabric. Yeah, for Fabric. But you don't get React 18 yet until React Native 69. Which is coming, uh, I don't know exactly when, but it is coming soon. So you'll actually have full React, Na React 18 in React Native, which is awesome. 
Yeah, absolutely. So in summary, there was a lot of terms. There are a lot of terms out there that kind of come with it. But the really, really important takeaway is what we were talking about. A lot of the flicker problems that you might have experienced that are going away are also going to be optimized and taken care of in React Native. Your ability to synchronize and use features and then also interrupt the React 18 features are going to be there. And then, of course, no more bridge uh, conceptually. You'll be able, no more serialization, deserialization on a single thread. This is going to be a significant speed boost. Yeah, and it's, it's uh, Meta is trying to make it so that React and React Native aren't sort of like two different things in, in some ways. They're really trying to keep React Native, keep pace with React, mm -hmm. stay up with the latest stuff. It's a lot of work. This has been in, this has been, you know, long time coming. I don't know, two, three years, something like that. Because there's a lot of work to make this work. So, uh, but the exciting thing about it is that you as React developers have access to the mobile platforms now. And not only can you write React apps for mobile through systems like Expo and, and other cool systems, but you can also, if you need to, dig into the native layer yeah. and you're not limited by whatever is exposed by React Native. And uh, I'm, I'm really excited about it. We obviously, with our consultancy, we, we, we work on this stuff all the time. And when our clients come to, come to us with a problem, we know that we can say, yeah, that can be done. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's really important that if you're interested in this and you're kind of set there, come talk to us afterward. We have some people here from Meta. We'll introduce you to those people as well. People, of course, from Expo, all ready to nerd out on React Native and what's Big coming time. along. So definitely yeah. check that out. But if you want to get in touch with them, you got to get in touch with us. So <laughs> I'm Gant Laborde. You can follow me on Twitter with at Gant Laborde. And I'm Jamin Holmgren. You can find me at Jamin Holmgren. I talk way too much React Native on there. So <laughs> if you like to nerd out about it, you can definitely go there. Also, I do Twitch streaming. And we have a podcast, React Native Radio. Check mm. that out. Yes. You won't have to look at my face then. Uh, you can actually just, just listen to me. And we have to say a super special thanks to one of our employees who did a ton of homework, lots of open source contributions, and bringing in the information in a way that really helped out. Lizzie, thank you so much. I know she's watching right now on the live stream. Lizzie did a lot of the work for us. We're just, we're just here presenting. We stand up here <laughs> and take credit for her work. That's, that's, I guess, what we do. So. Yeah, just yeah. next time, take her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, absolutely. Thank you so much, React Thought. Thank you. Thank you.